Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me today is another dope indie cartoonist. I have Dave Hallett. We're here to talk his book, The Makers. I know you started as digital, you're starting to do print. So um, I, I know the second one dropped, I believe, recently. If I remember yep. correct. Right. right. And uh, yeah, it's just a pleasure to have you on uh, Talk Comics with you, dude. Thanks for having me. First off, I always like to ask everybody, you know, kind of a little bit of their uh, secret origin kind of, if you will, with comic books, how they started off as a fan, and then in turn, uh, why that made you want to jump on, into the creative side of it? Uh, well, I kind of have to give away my age by saying this, but <laughs> I got into comics very, very early on because I don't know if you remember the Electric Company co-produced a Spider-Man comic with Marvel called Spidey Super Stories. I know that. It was like sort of a younger reader's version of Spidey Adventures, and my mom used to buy those for me. So she had me reading comics before I even started school. Uh, so I don't really remember a time when I wasn't obsessed with comics. <laughs> and honestly, making them came pretty close on the heels of reading them. So Okay, and uh, so past like that first comic book, or the ones that you got, when you started kind of discovering them for yourself and, and getting really into the meat of what comics are and can be, um, what were some of the early books that really stood out to you, creators that really stood out to you? Uh, well, I was a Marvel kid, mostly. Um, Avengers, I, like some of my first issues were like George Perez Avengers comics. Nice. And then, uh, but I, 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 at that point, I wasn't able to identify the artist. I think it was like, I got an issue of Uncanny X-Men 129 in a trade with a friend at school. Like we used to trade comics back and forth. And I got that. And the art was, was John Byrne and Terry Austin. And that one really popped at me. So Consequently, Byrne was the first guy whose style I could recognize, um, and then he became one of my favorites. And then, uh, you know, it was a short hop, skip, and a jump to like a Frank Miller Daredevil after that. And uh, yeah, like those guys were sort of like the foundation of it. Like Miller, I'm still a huge fan of. Byrne and Perez, I still appreciate, but it's not really what I gravitate towards these days. So, yeah, I, I, I totally get it. I mean, just even as a fan, I'm not a creator myself, but like I, I notice that stuff that used to be the things I would I would kind of go to. I'm kind of, I, I still appreciate it again, but I start like leaning more towards into like, you know, way different styles than maybe I would have even have liked as a kid. So when did you, when did you first start making your own comics? When did that first begin? Uh, well, I, my earliest memory of trying to make a comic is actually more like me trying to make newspaper strips. Like somewhere I have to find one of these days, my mom probably has it, but I made this weird little newspaper that was all kind of like news stories and comic strips and there was like a little iron man strip where he was which is weird so i'm not even a big iron man fan but i just remember him like going into a cave and meeting a giant ant and then i guess it was to be continued um but i was just trying to like figure out that form of like okay here's the panel this happens this this sort of like figuring out the storytelling structure but then that was mixed with weird little news stories one about a a bank robbery where the getaway car crashed into a, a building on its escape at, at 5,000 miles an hour. And the last one was no one was hurt, <laughs> which I don't even understand how that's possible. Uh, but then, yeah, like in elementary school, I got into making little sort of parody comics, like, you know, parodies of like G.I. Joe and Transformers. Cause I was a big mad and cracked fan. So like, I wouldn't copy them, but I would just sort of pass them around to my friends or whatever. So those are probably my first real attempt at making a comic book. And when, when was it that you started kind of doing your, like, publishing stuff, right? Like, The Makers, is that your, that's not your first book, right? Like, what, what preceded that? Um, it probably would have been, like, around 95, 96 when Strange Adventures, which is the store I work at, uh, opened. And they started carrying, or opened in Halifax, rather, started carrying, like, indie comics and zines and whatnot. I thought, oh, I can get in on this. So I made, like, a five-issue werewolf story called Bad Moon Rising. So that probably would have been the first one then that I like, you know, copied and distributed, I guess. Can, can you talk a little bit about the projects and, and uh, that you've that you've been a part of, that you've worked on and in terms of like, you know, what, what it takes to do the self-publishing thing and, instead of, you know, like, because that's way different. That's really like more of like the punk rock, the grassroots type of, of way of doing comics, right, is, is doing the zines and doing your own self-publishing, mailing this stuff out yourself. Like, what does that really entail? And and can you talk about some of the projects that you've done before you did The Makers, the current project? Sure. Um, yeah, well, uh, like I said, there was Bad Moon Rising and then uh, 
some friends and I collaborated on kind of like an anthology, humor anthology called Highly Dubious that we would all do short stories for. And that was very simply just, you know, photocopied up at Kinko's or whatever, stapled them together, pass them around. And then I did, I did a, a three issues of a comic called Scenester in the early 2000s that was kind of like a parody of like zine culture and stuff. It was just like four friends who get together and start doing a pop culture zine, one of whom was focused on movies, another one was focused on music, another one on comics, one on the actual like, you know, uh, creation of the, the comic. So just sort of like little parodies of fan culture and stuff like that. That was early 2000s. So I would take these big breaks. I would do a project and then I would kind of just feel burnt out and get away from it for a couple of years and then come back to it. Uh, a couple of years after that, though, I did a five issue miniseries called Slamorama. That was sort of my love letter to 1980s pro wrestling. That was just sort of like a night in the life of an, a fictional 80s wrestling federation, essentially. Uh, and then I've been drawing, providing the art for a comic that a couple of friends of mine wrote called The Last Paper Route, which is that they were paper boys back in the 90s. And it's sort of like, semi-autobiographical but obviously highly fictionalized adventures of these two paper boys in the 90s when you know newspapers were still a thing uh so they're yeah. writing and i'm just doing the art for it and yeah. then, uh that's sort of been on a hiatus for a while and in that hiatus the idea for seems for uh for the makers started to percolate and uh you know the pandemic just kind of kicked it into high gear like i need something to focus on beside the world falling apart so i'm gonna tackle this thing can you talk a little bit about the makers and the idea behind that and you know why why now why why did now feel like the time to kind of drop this type of book uh, now mostly because i really in the last few years have been sort of reevaluating image comics like i was you know buying comics when image happened and it seemed very exciting at first and then eventually you know it all fell apart with them kind of turning on each other or selling out to different companies or whatever and I sort of got very quickly disillusioned with it. Like, oh, this was an experiment that failed. And, you know, these guys were not the real deal or whatever. But then, you know, and I kind of talked down about the company and what they put out, but have since gone back to a lot of it. And just now in our current age of decompressed storytelling and things like that, I, I found that there's just a lot more excitement to be found there in terms of like every page was like, let's just make every page awesome. Let's make every issue awesome. Let's just put a bunch of cool stuff on a page who cares if it makes sense we just want to make an exciting comic book for people to read and you know like also re-examining the idea that these were young guys who, like a lot of them are just still in their early 20s and suddenly forced into the business of being creatives but also publishers and businessmen and feeling a little more charitable towards them like you know who, how do you juggle all of that so i just got really thinking about that time and just sort of what was in the air at the time of like artists being these rock stars and uh decided to just around that same time i sought out the documentary the image revolution have you seen this one i love that yeah i like the documentary. Yeah, it blew my mind and i thought there's a real story here like this is like at first i was going to just do like a fictionalized origin story for like an image comics type of thing but then the more i thought about it the more i thought well, it might be kind of fun to mix other elements into it and see if i can tell a bigger story just about you know creation essentially and like the, the creator's responsibility to the creation and vice versa. So I started mixing in a lot of elements of other things that I liked. And then, uh, yeah, I just kind of kept building. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting. You talk about like going back to like the image stuff recently, right? Like I think that, and I think it, it helped in large part due to the cartoonist KFib channel itself, not just the group. The group has been, is phenomenal. I mean, sometimes I think I ch I check in more in the group than necessarily what the channel's putting out. And they put out daily videos, right? But I can only keep up so much. But, um, you know, I, I'm i a little bit younger than you. So, like, I was around when Image, when Image formed, but I was younger. So I didn't, like, really discover the books until maybe, like, a few years into Image. And, you know, I, I had my favorites, right? I liked it. But then I, you know, as I got older, and I got these through back issues, but as I got older... You know, I was more DC, Marvel, and then Vertigo, and eventually I would get Image, but more like Image as we know it now, right? Like, it's way different than its inception. And mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, the Wizard Magazine episodes that they were Ed and Jim were doing, and the group, like, man, I kind of want to go back and get some of the stuff that I, I didn't get. And it reignited my love for early Image, you know, and, and just the, the passion and excitement that was coming out from those books right so just so much of it and 
that's why I think that your book really stood out when, you know, Craig CK recommended the book to me. Um, and he told me what you kind of were riffing on. I'm like, dude, that's, that's awesome. You mentioned the image revolution, um, documentary. I also watched that not that long ago. We had Todd do his documentary that was on TV. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see all this stuff resurfacing almost 30 years later, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary. So, um, yeah, I'm really, I really dug the book, dude. I, I know that you have more issues digital. Um, what was the reason though? To, to do print and newsprint? Uh, well, first of all, let me just jump back and say thank you for reminding me about Cartoonist Cafe because that was a huge part of it. Like, as I was starting to go through image and stuff, Cartoonist Cafe kind of hit the scene and I was all in on that. In fact, we had Ed and Jim come here for the Dartmouth Comic Arts Festival in 2019 and they did a live episode here at it. So it was a real thrill to get to meet them and talk to them about all this stuff. Um, but yeah, like, Doing it digitally first just kind of made the most sense of like, well, you know, you get them printed, you got to store them somewhere, and then you got to sell them and all that jazz. So they always get it so that it's out in the world and people can find it. Uh, but my employer, Callum Johnson, the owner of Strange Adventures, was really the one who pushed for and ultimately footed the bill for getting it printed. He just really wanted to, like, he's always kind of dabbled in publishing as well. Like when I started working for him, he was putting together an anthology of all the local creators and stuff like that. So it's always something he's kind of had in mind. You know, it's really like to sort of shepherd creators and getting their stuff out in the world. And he was like, well, you know, do you want to do this as a physical thing? Like, and there's a publisher nearby or sorry, a print company nearby that actually can do newsprint comic books with a slick cover. He, he's done a few things with them and he's like, let's do it through them. We really like what they do. And uh, yeah. So then it just became a process of getting it ready for print and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, his faith in me gets fulfilled <laughs> like you know people seem to like the book so far it's got to keep pushing it. i mean i'm almost done issue five digitally that'll hopefully be up in the next couple of weeks so there's a good head start in terms of where we're at but uh you know it's also it's not cheap to get books printed um then you got to stash them somewhere then you got to sell them um but the newsprint thing was something he was really pushing for like that's something that they do really well and you know he's a couple years older than me he really remembers the newsprint feel and people really seem to respond to it um colors just really look good on them uh yeah i don't know it just seemed like the logical choice and although i do think sometimes like ah oh, this is about the image comics era maybe it should be on something a little more slick but i don't know i'm i'm a child of a certain era as well and i like to see newsprint too so yeah i mean i either way i mean you could say yeah image i mean early image i mean i have a spot number one that was on newsprint so and but yeah there was like newsstand versions of this stuff too right yeah. so and and then the rest of the industry was newsprint right in the 90s i mean that's how i remember my comic books were on newsprint so i have a huge affinity like I, if there if there's you give me the option of getting a trade paperback of a reprint of a stuff that i could get on newsprint for maybe around the same price i'll just get the single issues in newsprint and for me it's not about at that point, it, it I take the collectability aspect out of it. It's more how I prefer to read it. And there's just something about, I, I, I mean, it, I know it's weird, but I know I'm not the only one. I like the smell of newsprint. I like the smell of old comic books. Like, I'm, I'm weird like that. And no, I totally agree. And I, I just love, I mean, I've heard, I, I, I'm kind of curious too, though, before I forget, is it true that printing on newsprint sometimes, is nowadays, is it more expensive? Or is that not true? I've heard I don't know for sure. Okay. I can't really okay. That, but uh, it's, it's it's probable. It's possible. I don't really know. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't be okay. surprised. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like I feel like I, I I don't know where I heard it. Just something that kind of popped up in a conversation with somebody that because it's not done as frequently, you there's not a lot of people necessarily that do it. Also, so it's kind of niche. You know what I mean in terms of like the cost, right? But um. Yeah, I think that, I, I mean, even going, you know, into your, your fake ads that you have for the stuff, I, I just think that the product that you put out is is such an awesome book. And, you know, I kind of want to know, like, what, what do you do from here, right? Like you said, you're almost done serializing issue five online. I haven't, I'm waiting for the print because for me, I, I, I need it in my hand. You know, it's just something about that, <laughs> that reading thing. I'm like, I stare to, I, I say this all the time. I stare to screen enough. For my job, for this, for the YouTube channel, or whether it's on my phone, my reading needs to be done with a book or a comic in my hand. 
you know, so I just want to know, you know, what we can expect next from the series. How far out do you have planned? Uh, what your ultimate goal is with the book? Uh, well, I'm first of all, I'm with you on the print versus digital. Like, uh, I I, I want to have a foot in digital because I feel like in some ways maybe that's where the industry is headed. Maybe Agreed. not. I don't know. But I don't want to shut the door on it. I don't want to just be like locked into an older way of doing things. I want to kind of keep other options open. But uh, but yeah, I definitely prefer print. Like I had a Marvel comic. Uh, Mar Marvel Unlimited subscription for a while and I eventually canceled it because it's just not the same. It just somehow yeah. psychologically was not fulfilling to me. Um, so yeah, I definitely am a print guy too. Uh, it's a six issue series. So I'm really close to the end of it. Um, okay. So yeah, like I guess right now it's mostly just getting issue five out the door. Then I guess at some point getting issue three ready for print and on and on and on. But then I got to try to bring it all in for a landing with issue six. And then, uh, then I will have said everything I want to say on the subject, hopefully. Um, you know, like, uh, and then after that, I don't quite know what's left. Like, I got to finish the last paper route when I get the final script for that, because that's a five-part miniseries. And I'm kind of toying around with another concept I want to do when this is done, but it'll be in a totally different direction. It'll be something else entirely. Okay. Have you thought about maybe doing, like, a one-shot of the books, of the leads of the makers, like of their respective books, maybe like an issue, like, I don't know, make up a random number, right? Issue 162 of Hellfire or something like that. Has that thought ever crossed your mind as a kind of like uh, a little thing to do? Not really. It's a fun idea. I mean, who knows when I'm done, I could feel like I'm like, I've got more to say on it or I'm still ready to play right. around in this universe a little bit. So I, like I said, I don't want to close the door on anything, but uh, it's not really in the works just yet. My main focus is just, getting through it like you get to that thing where you're working on a thing for so long so i've been working on this in some form or fashion probably since about 2018 at least kicking ideas around okay. and i'm at the point where i'm so close to the end of it but it's just like you just gotta get through it just gotta get through it you know like i'm kind of yeah. tired of looking at it in some regards but i'm also going to be sad when it's over um yeah that that's the main focus right now is to just try to bring it in for a landing as best i can all right cool well is there anything else that you, I mean, besides what you've talked about, anything else that you got in the works, anything that you're, any ideas you can kind of like, you want to talk about or tease maybe of things that you'd like to be able to do uh, coming up? Nothing that's really fully formed enough to talk about yet. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I have two or three different ideas about what I might do when this is done. And none of them are really fully formed enough for me to discuss. Like, I'd love to do something in the horror genre because I'm a big fan of that too. I don't know. Uh, probably like, some collaborations have popped up, some ideas for collaborations, but I find I'm a bit of a megalomaniac and I want to do everything myself. So uh, yeah, just finding whatever I want to devote a couple more years to, I guess. We'll see. Okay. And, you know, I, I like you work in a shop and I've, I'm kind of curious. I, I don't often get to talk to fellow, you know, people that work in a shop, but obviously besides the people I work, work with, or my buddy who I do the podcast with, he works at another shop that's like 40 minutes away from me. How, how does that experience working in a shop kind of influence the way you create the products that you're putting out? Well, it gives you a unique perspective for sure, because you can sort of see where trends are going and how customers are reacting to certain things. And uh, like I said, I was really down on image for a long time because I started working in a shop around the time that image was kind of falling apart, like around the time of Liefeld getting, you know, well, about to be getting booted up, but then quitting. And, uh, you know, and I've sort of seen over the course of time, how like piecemeal things have been kind of picked away at by the big two, like all the Wildstorm stuff going over to DC and Marvel Comics getting a hold of Angela. So you get this sort of longer perspective on things, but also like the business side of it. And that, that was what sort of made me really sympathetic to the image guys in a lot of ways, just this idea of like, you can't fight city hall sort of like somehow the big two end up owning it. <laughs> like so yeah. that, that, that kind of corporate perspective paid into a lot of it. I don't know. You just sort of get a unique perspective as a fan of this stuff, obviously, but also a purveyor of it. You get to sort of uh, observe at a remove somewhat the way the business works. And that can be incredibly frustrating and depressing, but it also can provide a lot of insight. So as I'm sure, you know, too, a fan and a, a salesman of it, you know, it uh, can get a little hard to separate yourself from it sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, I say it a lot, you know, I think that the, the speculation aspect of 
the industry noticing that in you know the couple the two i mean i've worked in shops when i was younger but yeah you know, i was like 14 13 you know what i mean like i i wasn't paying attention to that i was just there i got paid store credit so i could get my comics or i was doing back issues or whatever but now you know i'm i'm hand selling stuff I, I internet manager um so like just watching the speculation sometimes it takes the joy out of comic books because you're just watching these people that don't give two shits about the comic they're buying they just want to make money off of it and like for me it's like then i talked to i talked to one of my coworkers too who's one of the managers at our other locations and i'm like dude how did you do this job because i took over his I'm like how did you do this and not just like get the joy sucked out of you in terms of comics. He's like, no, I get it, dude. He's like, sometimes you just got to walk away from that desk. and You got to go talk to some people about comics that you know care and want some recommendations because, you know, they're, I mean, it's a necessary evil. I get it. I get that they're part of the ecosystem of how comic books kind of stay in business because those people funnel money. But yeah, it is, it is interesting the the perspective that you get kind of being behind the scenes in just in comic shops and the retail side, because being behind the scenes as a creator is way different, I think, than being um, on the retail aspect of it, you know, and seeing like the people come in. So what's hot this week? Mm, yeah, you got any keys? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. What, what do you mean by hot? What, what does that mean? And he's like, well, you know, like, what's hot? I'm like, no, I don't know what you mean. Are you looking for a book that you can flip and make money? Like, I'll just, I flat out just say it. I'm like, because I'm not, I don't have any of those. If you want those, those are going to cost you, you know? So. Yeah, my, my line is always like, you know, when someone asks me, like, well, you know, is this going to be worth money? Like, what should I buy that's going to be a good investment? And yeah. I say, if, I knew that, I, if I knew the answer to that, I'd buy lottery tickets, you know? I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, it gets me down, too, because uh, recently, I don't know if you read the Image Comics series Stray Dogs. Uh, yeah, we did. A, I actually did a signature series with uh, Tony Fleece. He's a friend of the shop. So, yeah, I know. Okay, because yeah, I really, really dug that series. It was and it awesome. Was so good. And like came to such a satisfying conclusion, loved it. And, uh, you know, we got in some, like there was like the multiple printings and we bundled them up together to sell as like a collection to people. And one guy came in and was asking for it and he was buying it. I was like, oh man, this series is so good. I'm so glad you're buying it. He was just like, yeah, here it's really hot. And just, you know, it was like the air going out of a balloon. It's like, this guy's not going to read this. Like, why am no. I even selling it to him? I'd rather sell it to someone that's going to read it and like it, you know? And it's also a weird tell when someone uses the term hot. I feel like almost like, is this someone that hasn't bought comics since the 90s when there used to be all those little American entertainment ads? It'd be like, new series, red hot. <laughs> like, this yeah. is kind of outdated terminology. But yeah, that stuff super gets me down because it can really kill a book in some ways. It's like a first issue comes out and it's really good. And then the speculators get wind of it and it all gets gobbled up. And then, you know, there's that wait time between the second or third or fourth print it comes out. And then sort of the enthusiasm can get dwindled away while people wait for the printing, you know, cause you, I don't know. I just, yeah, that stuff disgusts me, but it's probably, and as you say, it is part of the ecosystem. That's where a lot of the money comes from. Yeah. You know, the, the crazy back issue boom that we're in again right now is. All yeah, it's nuts. Of, yeah. It's really out of, I don't know. It's wild. But, it's uh, crazy because yeah. it's crazy because like this we have three sh there's three locations at the shop i work at i work at the main one um but we don't have back issues so we'll have like a showcase where i'll you know since I'm, i go through the stuff the collections you buy i'll put some stuff in there and we'll have but it's mostly like variants right here in one case and then some old stuff that's like kind of in vg fine condition right that i'll throw in there but yeah just the the influx of people wanting back issues and I'm like, well, we don't have them in our location. You have to go to the other one. And it's like, it's really weird to see the industry shift because for a little bit, I think, and that's why the shop I'm at did it too, is a lot large graphic novel selection. It's a comic book store. You know what I mean? Like we have a lot of that. I mean, we have all the new stuff, but not a lot of old stuff. But yeah, the back issues are just, it's insane. People call, do you have, do you have quarter bids? Do you have 50 cent? I'm like, no. And I'll just be like, well, you can go to this store. I know where you can go. I know what you want to do, you know, because I went through those bins too. I mean, sometimes you discover an old book that like, oh man, this is dope. You know, like an old eighties black and white or a nineties something or other. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's funny that you brought up Stray Dogs because it's like, it, you talk about killing a book, right? It's like, we have to take it off the shelf. Mm -hmm. but if a book is going for $20 day of release, I get the text. You got to pull it off the shelf and then you're killing a title, right? Like you're essentially killing that book from gaining new readership 
at your locate at your store because you can't you don't want some random coming in off the street buying it and then flipping it we'll also do customer too yeah i don't know it, it's interesting it's funny to hear somebody else say what i feel too you know well, that's why it's so important to like engage your customers and talk to them and see if they actually are reading it too because then you kind of get a sense of who's a speculator who's a reader and i would much rather put a book in the hands of someone that's going to read it and enjoy it than someone yes. that's going to send it off to cgc or whatever um so yeah, like that to me, those are the customers I really like dealing with are the ones who are reading this stuff and enjoying it. And we're like, oh my God, did you read this new issue? What do you think of the art on this one? You know, just get a sense. That's really the joy of it. And kind of the counterbalance to the speculating stuff is the people that are buying the stuff from me that are really into it because they just love the medium. And those are the ones yeah. that I really want to talk to. Oh yeah. That's the fun, that's the best part about working in a shop. Hands down is people on to new stuff and kind of introducing them to things that you think are really awesome. And then when they come back and they're like, man, that was really dope. Can you recommend something else? Like to me, that's yeah. like, that's the, that's why I work at a shop completely, you know, you know, and you know, before we get out of here, I, I always kind of like to ask people, sometimes I forget, but uh, you know, we're talking about some of the stuff we don't like about the people that go to the shop, but I'd love to hear maybe some of the things that you're currently reading or some of the creators that you're currently digging, even, you know, whether it's, guys from the group that were a part of on Facebook or, you know, maybe somebody at Marvel DC, which anything. Uh, well, yeah, Marvel and DC, I don't really tend to read a whole lot of lately. Like I find more and more I'm gravitating more towards like what I would call like auteur comics, like the fewest amount of people working on it, the better. Um, yeah. You know, when you get into like there's all these different people, all these layers of corporate interference, I've been reading superhero comics long enough that I just like, there's no point in getting all that invested in it because you know a new creative team can come in and it gets all paved over so like my current favorite 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 right now is copra by michelle fifa yes it really just kind of lit a fire under me when i got into it because like i tried reading it once i bought the first cut like round read the first two chapters like yeah it's all right i don't know i don't know if i'm feeling it right now and then i came back to it at the right time and i just dove right in and it has become like my all-time favorite um so yeah that one Every new issue, every time a new issue drops, it's so exciting to me. Uh, what else? Remember? Cancor, I don't know if you're reading that. Matthew Allison. Dude, Cancor. so dope, yeah. The new issue last week blew my mind. Uh, Jesse Lonergan's Hedra was a recent one that I liked a lot. Uh, Planet Paradise by him as well. Um, <laughs> take it back to the image, guys. I am reading a Savage Dragon comic a day right now because I bought a collection of like 160 issues of it from a guy for the price of shipping. It was like most of the first 160 issues for like 30 nice. bucks, I think it was. And uh, eventually I've been filling in the gaps. I need awesome. nine issues to get them all now. But I'm at the point now, I was like, the only way I'm going to get caught up to the present day is if I just read one a day. And I think I have about 20 left and I'll be caught up. But I've just been every day sitting down and reading a dragon. And I just find it absolutely fascinating just because I can't think of any other book like it where it is just an auteur superhero comic that has been going for this long and going you know, presumably till he doesn't want to do it anymore. Uh, so that's one of my favorites. Uh, I just finished reading the latest and I guess final issue of Bitter Root by David F. Walker. Chuck it's Walker. on break. Yeah, it's, it does seem like it's going to come back because they were talking online a lot, like the conclusion, the ending. I was, oh, I guess that's it. But then you get to the end of the issue and they say there is going to be more. But uh, but yeah, I thought that was really strong. Yeah. Uh, God, yeah. What else? Kaiju Max by Xander Cannon. I don't know if you've ever read that one. Um, is that the Aftershock book? No, it's Oni. It's uh, there's an oh that's kaiju score that's after yes that's kaiju score we're sort of in a weird little golden age of kaiju books right now it seems <laughs> like. uh but yeah kaiju max is sort of like hbo's oz if it was set on monster island from the godzilla movies just like a really kind of gritty prison drama set amongst all of these giant monsters guarded by like ultraman power ranger type guys highly recommend it that's going to be coming to an end pretty soon but i'm loving that one yeah i don't know i could probably go on and on all right, cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that you said Savage Dragon. I want to put a complete run together, too, because, like, I think I have the first, I only have, like, the first 50, and then it's, like, bits and pieces, and then it just gets expensive as you as you get more and more to the current stuff, because the print run, I think, is a lot, becomes a lot smaller. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I love that book. I love Eric Larson. I That was always, I think that was always my favorite of the Image Founders books, was Savage Dragon. You know what I mean? Like, I think that I, I like, I think I liked Wildcats because I liked Jim Lee at one point, but going back and reading it, I'm like, well, it's not one of my favorites anymore. Uh, Spawn, obviously, because of Todd. Uh, I think the art was always really good. 
Mm-hmm. Liefeld, he was always putting out some cool shit, but Eric Larson was just always at the top, dude, because he was he was the one that stayed on the book and continued to fucking just keep powering away. And uh he takes it in such weird directions continuously, and he's kind of keeping you excited about the book. You never know where the book's gonna end up ever. Yeah, it's never predictable. Yeah, like he's, like, as you say, he's the only guy that really fulfilled the promise from early on of like, this is my book, I'm going to do it, nobody else is going to do it. To the fact that he went back and redid it issue 13 when they did Image X months, <laughs> yeah. so that he did the issue of it. And you know, where I am now, it's gotten to the point where it's like, become very X-rated. <laughs> it's like, there's yeah. a lot of crazy sex happening in it, and also a lot of crazy gore. And as you say, totally unpredictable. The way, the way I look at it is that it's like, this guy's job every month is to sit down and write and draw a book called Savage Dragon. And he's got to keep the writer or the, the readership interested, but he's got to keep himself engaged too. So like, you can't just do the same thing month after month. So you start getting into weird experimentation with panels. Like one issue will be all splash pages. Another one will be all nine panel grids. Another one will be all some other panel configuration. And then, yeah, like mixing up the content and getting into some weird areas with where he wants to take it. But I'm always down to see what he does. Cause yeah, it's, it's a wild ride. I'm loving it. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, I, I can't. I it's one of the books I'm always excited for every time it comes out. And the fact that it's been on a monthly schedule, you know, uh, post uh, the shutdown and stuff, it's it's just it's one of my favorite books. And um, yeah, you know, before I let you go, dude, I just want to thank you again um, for you know chatting with me. It's been it's been fun talking comic books, talking working at a shop. I don't often get to talk to other people about that, um, but bef- I'd love for you to share where we can find your book and where we can find you online. I'm going to drop all the links down below in the comments for people to find. Sure. Uh, the best, the one, the social media I'm probably most active on is Instagram. And my handle there, it's, it's Paschetti Western, which is like P-A-S-K-E-T-T-I and then Western. Um, and I'm also on Gumroad. That's where I'm selling my stuff through, um, which there's a link in my bio on Instagram to it. And I'm on Twitter under the same handle. Um, and, you know, all this, the comics can be bought through strangeadventures.com too, which is the shop I work at. Um, so, yeah, that's that's probably your best bet. Instagram is the one, like I say, that I'm the most active on. That's where I post my Savage Dragon daily posts too. So, Cool, man. Well, again, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me. And I would love to do this with you again, dude. Sure, anytime. Let me know.